excitement and I didn't have anything to stay with me at all. I've got to make the city somehow and the only way I can is to hide his word in my heart. It's something inside me. More now than ever I feel the need. I never appreciated the truth, the word of truth, and more in my life than I appreciate it today. I uh, I ask your kindness uh, some of the things that I feel on my heart seem so very simple but uh, I can't help it I, I feel like that sometimes this probably is what we need more than we need some elaborate mess I'm going to the book of Proverbs and I don't know of anyone here that hasn't heard this mentioned at least one time or another. Chapter 3, and let's start with the first verse and go through the fourth verse. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck, write them upon the table of thine heart, so shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. It's a simple message today of balance that I want to talk to you about. 
and hope that it can help somebody. You're going to gain balance in your Christian experience and in your theories and ideas, or you're going to fall. Yes, sir. It's just the law that if it's out of balance, gravity will see to it that it falls. Yes, sir. If the balance rock ever gets over balance, she's a goner. Yes. And that is what I would like to talk to you. I did not come, I don't even know. I just, I thought, well, dear Lord, what in the world does this people need? I don't know. I don't know. I know some of your preachers here, and that, but uh, there are Pentecostal pockets. You understand what I'm saying? I will be offended. We've got one in the Gulf Coast area, and it needs picking every once in a while. It gets stagnant. And you've got them in Oklahoma, the Pentecostal pockets. And you get off on tangents and get little ideas and whirl around the same theme. And then they'll get one in Louisiana, and they'll get one in Indiana, they'll get one here and there, the Pentecostal pockets. Believe me, they, they need airing out. I don't care who it is, where you're from, how smart you are, how close your claim or claim or idea, your little Pentecostal pocket needs to be opened and aired out. And something new come in, somebody new and fresh. I preached for a man one time that uh, constantly, now young men, don't take this as an example. I did a lot of things I shouldn't have done and are still good. So please don't take this for an example. You cannot go around rebuking pastors as an evangelist and get by with it. And I'm not encouraging that, but the man asked me one day, I was preaching for him, and he says, I cannot, can you tell me? And of course, it doesn't always mean they want you to answer me. And I found that out. Yeah. But he asked me. He said, I wonder what's the matter. And he had one of the largest churches in Pentecost at that time. Yes, still does. He said, I cannot get a vengeance. And I paid good at this. He did. He paid real well. And uh, I just can't get them. I just somehow or another, they don't like to come here. I said, well, if you would like for me to help you on that, I can, I believe. I've been here a week, and your church don't even know I'm here. Uh, all right. He, uh, constantly, he and his wife were constantly reminding everybody that, uh, in fact, one of the deacons came up to me and said, Brother Bean, this is the best revival we've ever had. And the pastor's wife said, we didn't need Brother Bean to have a revival. Now, the reason I said that was not in defense of myself. That's ridiculous. But you can develop pockets in your own local church. And I told him, I said, sir, if you're going to wind up with some... Pentecostal idiots. My cousin went to a little community in Holland. He brought pictures home and showed us. And in this little community, for over a hundred years, there had not been one new person moved in there. As a result, they were intermarrying until they had married sisters. And believe me, you've heard of pointed heads. They had them. <laughs> they were idiots. I'm not saying that unkind or in any way. I'm telling you that the intermarriage caused it. Yes, yes sir. And uh, I fear that the things that are so valuable to all of us, there is no segments in God's church. There is no allowance for a part of the country to believe one thing and us believe another. It is the um, common salvation. It is the message for everybody. And don't ever let your congregation preacher or say don't ever get the idea that you'll only hear one preacher. One type of ministry. It's, uh, everybody has his type. 
Yes, sir. And I like all of it. And if the devil starts showing me something I don't like, I'm going to see through it that I like it before I'm pulled through it. Because I need to like it. I need to like it all. You've got some that foam at the mouth when they preach. Man, let them splatter. Dear God, I can get excited with them. I may not... Well, then I've seen them so slowly you wondered if they'd ever get started and sure enough wondered when they're going to stop. Let them go. Let them go. Yes, sir. We need balance. Yes, sir. And he has chosen a variety of ministries to bring to us that balance. And I feel such a need of it in our day, it screams at me. God would grant unto us. There is not one soul today that is in error that started out right but what got out of balance somewhere and uh, overbalanced in some phase of their life. And that's why that God has chosen the fivefold ministry to bring balance. And I want it. Let not mercy and truth forsake me. Bind it about thy neck, and you'll wind up with favor in the sight of God and in the sight of man. Yes, sir. Isn't that a marvelous hope? Wouldn't you know, like today, every young preacher here has this ambition. Surely, I'd like to find favor with this audience. But at the same time, have favor with you. And that's not always easy to do. That's not a simple matter. And saint of God, you uh, you've got that that uh, tight rope to walk also. That you find favor in the sight of God and man. Bless God, I don't care what you think about. It. Well, that's a good. I've said that. I've said it a lot of times. As in the heat of my sermon, I was so determined that I preach independent of their will that I would say, bless God, if you don't like it, there's the door. I think everybody's swung wild at least once in their life. And uh, I think everybody ought to allow that once in a while. Because uh, the anointing gets on you. And I believe the Holy Ghost wants you to remain independent. I don't have a friend right now. I don't have a wife. I don't have any children. I don't have a friend here. Yes, sir. I'm the loneliest man on this campground right now. Yes, sir. And after it's over with, I'll shake your hand. But right now, I better not let one of you influence me. All right. All right. If we keep our course right, we're going to have to preach without influence. In church, you should never want your preacher to be influenced. Even the times you express yourself underneath that ought to be in your heart. Please don't listen to me, preacher. Tell me what I need to know. Mercy and truth. It would be a marvelous thing. We would be far, far into Canaan's land today instead of wandering in the wilderness of confusion and ideas and if we could have received balance a long time ago. I'm not saying I had it. I'm not saying that I've attained it. I find myself at times taking those things that I personally enjoy and staying with them. A preacher can do that. He can uh, read the Bible with one thought in mind. I want this type of sermon and I enjoy preaching that time. If I had my likes or dislikes today, I would... Uh, I guess I preach on the condescension all the time. There is nothing more beautiful to me than the fact that the high God of heaven became a man. Oh, I can get excited preaching that, and I'd find that in every verse if I would let myself. Just about every place I'd look, I'd be looking for condescension. And uh, I like it. But that's not helping. It's not right that I should preach what I enjoy. It's uh, it's good once in a while to just cross everything in your nature and uh, let God take over and feed us what we need to be fed. It's not good for you to desire certain sermons. 
I preached one time in a church that uh, one God and, and uh, Camelites was all they ever heard. I don't say that in kind. The man was great, built a great church and all of that. But uh, if you wanted to excite that audience, uh, head out against the Camelite and preach one God, and you had them, I mean, that is on their tiptoes. But when you preach the burden for the lost, they wouldn't want to sleep on you. They'd sit down on you. They wouldn't hear you. They wondered if you prayed today. In case you get no better messages than that, where is your excitement? But folks, we're going to have to have balance. All right, all right. All right. I if this side today was all mercy and no truth, then I would need to take my message on truth. If this side was all truth and no mercy, I need to preach on mercy. All right. And I may shock you today. And it's dangerous to preach. I, I mean, the operation I'm fixing to perform is dangerous. It's worse than cutting your gallbladder. I mean, it's close to your heart. It's close to your brain. I, one slip of the knife, and I've ruined you. I've made you misunderstand every purpose of the message. If you don't listen carefully and aloud today, then I, I'm in trouble. Yes. Because it's a tedious operation to bring to one group of people mercy and truth. While you're trying to show mercy, those who love that more than they love a standard or love message, they're saying, that's my man. And that's all they heard in that message. They never did hear that other part. Yes, sir. Those that love that's God, you're going to do it or go to hell, and I get on that line and and they say, that's my man, and they didn't even hear that other part. They heard what they wanted to hear. But can I beg you to hear all of it? It's the conclusion of the matter that makes the difference today, the great wise man said. Let's hear all of it. Let's study it all. Let's get it blended. God is a, is a perfect blend of mercy and truth. He is a perfect blend. I had a little experience, I think I've told this in a, maybe a church or two, but if, if you don't mind, let me uh, rehearse it. That helped me a whole lot. I uh, was driving down Interstate 10 going into downtown Houston, and I got uh, one of those little boys with a red light came up behind me and motioned me to pull over. I was speeding. I'm sorry, but I was. <laughs> I did it. You have to. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Don't let mercy leave you right now. Because I did. Oh, I wouldn't speak for nothing. Well, I'll get on your problem next time. All right. I know really what happened. No justification. That is, the law doesn't justify it, but the interstate at that time was 65 miles an hour and there's no changes no lights no nothing it's just all of a sudden as you get closer to town it reduces to 55 you're on the same nice smooth freeway and if you're not watching those little signs and i wasn't and he gave me a ticket due to my nature i carried the thing around and carried it around and i thought i had the date in my mind it was either the ninth or the twelfth I thought it was the 12th, and I waited to the 12th. I never liked to go pay them until the very last day. And uh, so I thought it was the 12th, and sure enough, it was the 9th. And in the meantime, they sent a warrant for my arrest. I called them up, and uh, I, I suddenly realized on the 12th that it was the 9th, and I called them, and I said, look, I'm... I'm overdue with this thing. I've got my dates mixed up, and I'd like to uh, know what I could do about it. 
not to rush in and pay it. They said, well, there's nothing you can do right now, Mr. Bean. You're, we have in the mail a warrant for your arrest, and the only way you can come in now is bring that warrant. So I waited, and sure enough, it came. And I went into that uh, building, but my eyes fell on the cornerstone. As I walked up the stairs, there's a cornerstone there that says, Justice with Mercy. Then I walked on in the building. That part of it sounded good. And uh, I was talking to the party there, and they said, Well, with this warrant, you'll have to go over here to the officer, and, and he'll take care of the warrants. So I go over there, and... Of course, in the meantime, the ticket has increased from $15 to $25. And the only way I can answer my warrant is to pay cash, and I didn't know that. I brought a check, and I didn't have the cash. And here I stand in front of this officer trying to figure out what to do. I didn't want to pay the ticket. I had to pay cash to release me from the warrant. I actually had turned myself in is what it amounted to. I was under arrest, if you want to know. <laughs> and I'm standing there trying to figure out the only alternative was go pay the full ticket. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to talk to the judge. But I can't get away from the desk now without a cash $25. And while I stood there, unsolicited and unmerited, and unknowing to me, there was a little voice behind me, a little young lady, very soft-spoken young lady, said, Hello, Brother Bean. <laughs> and I turned me about to see and this smiling little face looked up at me and said, Looks like you're in trouble. I said, yes, ma'am, I am. I quickly explained to her what my problem was, and I said, I would really like to talk to that judge. She smiled and said, I think that can be arranged. I'm the judge's secretary. I said, I just left his office, and no one was in there. And she looked at the officer and said, hand me the pink slip. And boy, he looked at her, and he, he didn't like that, but he handed her the pink slip, and she signed it, which released me from my warrant. She said, follow me. And I followed her down along the hall and came to an office, and she said, stay right here. She went on into this judge's office. I heard her talking. Reverend Bean, I know him. I didn't know her. Didn't know she existed. She had heard me preach at one of the churches. And after a while, she came out and said, Brother Bean, you can come on in now. The judge will receive you. And I walked in, and this mammoth office, big, long desk, and him sitting there, and he invited me to sit down, and I said, Judge, I noticed on that cornerstone out there a sign that says, Justice with Mercy. And that bound to be for somebody, and I'm pleading mercy. All right. And he said, uh, what's the matter, Reverend? You, uh, you wasn't paying attention. I thought he was trying to be helpful, help me answer the problem. Uh, and uh, he said, you was just, just wasn't paying attention. I said, sir, that's exactly right. Uh, that's what happened. And I explained. He said, well, the, the shame of that, Reverend Bean, is that most of the people that come through this office are good citizens like yourself. But they just didn't pay attention. And he said, the only way in the world we can get them to pay attention is get in their pocketbook. <laughs> That fell flat. <laughs> and uh, he talked a little while, and then he had in front of him my original ticket and my original warrant for arrest. And I guess he thought this girl was in my church. He said, if all of the members of your church is like this young lady, he said, I want you to know she is a model Christian. And he made it crystal clear. 
there wasn't a thing I said or did affected him. He said in her behalf. And he made that clear. I am going to release you. He said, I could charge you, fine you, and then suspend it. But it will be on your records. I'm going to throw this away. You don't have any records in the courthouse. And as he stood up to shake my hand, he said, go and speed no more. <laughs> I nearly left that office talking in time. <laughs> Not just because of the $25. No. But I had seen my life unfold in a matter of an hour and Yes, sir. Every one of us were guilty. Yes, And through neglect, our ticket was increasing, adding sin to sin. It was growing every day through neglect. There was a warrant for our arrest appointed of the man to die, and after that, the judgment. You, you got it only the sentence is there today. The only way to clear it, and we couldn't do it. I didn't have the cash. I couldn't have done it. If they were going to shoot me, I couldn't do it. The only alternative was to pay the fine, and that was eternal damnation. Unsolicited, unmerited, didn't even know the girl existed. In split-second timing, she found me and said, looks like you're in trouble. Signed my release and carried me to the judge's private office and that's the best place to talk to him. Don't wait till there's a crowd there. Don't wait till he's sitting at his desk or at his door. She went in ahead of me and had me wait till she prepared the way and then brought me into the house that says on its cornerstone, Justice with Mercy. Oh, and I pled mercy in all I tried my excuse and my little self-righteous act, and he knocked it flat and said it won't do. But in behalf of her, I totally wipe it out of the record. You can't go to Houston today and find where I've got a speeding ticket. Suspended or otherwise. Yes, my Lord. Praise the Lord. Grace found me. Mercy was standing behind me when I didn't even know it was there. Split second timing. It should have been two minutes late or two minutes early. Should have missed me. But he knows where I'm standing today. And he knows the way to the Hallelujah, that altar of prayer and that private room of mercy and grace. Grace led me there. I need mercy, you know it. Yes, sir. Don't let it leave me. After I found it, don't let me forget it. The next time I went to that girl's office, I didn't go by the desk where you pay tickets nor the ward officer's desk. I went straight to her office. It was in behalf of someone else who had failed. I knew the way this time. I could go this time for somebody else because I had been there. Amen. Praise the Lord. I need mercy. But don't let your mercy become a sense of sympathy. Don't let it become so humanitarian that it spares the aged or the youth or the crippled or the far away people or the poor. If you're not careful, you'll have all mercy and no truth. And the foreigner will be left to die in his sin. Old Aunt Susie, because she's old, well, you just can't bear the idea that that dear old darling would have to go to hell. 
Friend, age doesn't save you, and death doesn't transform you from saint, from sinner to saint. There's a message for all. God help me now to get that balance. And when I have attained it, I will have favor with God, and I'll have favor with man. Jeremiah was so burdened and so concerned for the lost that he was about to leave his message. So help me God, he was fixing to leave his message. I see the big thrust in our day and I hope the Lord will let me preach on it before I leave here. It's my burden. It's a, almost a pet subject of mine. I have preached revival in our day ever since I've been preaching, and I still believe it does not a thing change my mind. Amen. I've got some of the sweetest, dearest friends that say it's over, and they folded their hands to keep their 120. I've been preaching, and I still believe it does not a thing change my mind. Amen. I've got some of the sweetest, dearest friends that say it's over, and they folded their hands to keep their 120. I don't believe that. I can't accept it. Man, if that's true, I'm in the awfulest predicament that I've ever been in in my life. I don't want to believe that. I can't. My nature won't let me. My faith, my hunger, my trouble. And I don't believe it starts out to be trouble. I think that some of them sincerely were trying to hold, but they didn't know how. The thing I had to learn was this. Don't reduce your conscience to theirs, but forgive them. Because before it's over with, you're going to be breaking the law. And somebody's going to have to forgive you. If I, for the sake of peace, say, well, I'm not going to cause any trouble. So I'll just succumb to this idea. Uh, you've let down the message. There is such a thing as holding the truth in unrighteousness. Jesus, if you ever heard a preacher pray, hear me pray today and give us balance. <laughs> give us church government. The other idea, the opposite from that, is everybody obey God and take the thing over. Well, I know churches right now that if they have in church now, they open for anybody to come to the pulpit and take it over. That's the opposite extreme. I believe the complete way back to I say way back yonder, it's been quite a way, it seemed to me like. God gave me a message that I haven't forgotten, I still believe it's for our day. When they brought the ark home, they brought it on a cart made after the pattern of the Philistines' cart. God wasn't pleased. You know the problem. The man was killed by touching it. And when you make it, when you fix it like that you're going to tempt saints to touch it. What I'm saying is when you leave the door open and don't have the ministry in their place and church government, you are leaving a church family open and feeling the freedom to touch that thing. I tell you if a church is taught right, they're not going to want to touch it. All right. Yes, sir. All right. But if it's on a modern cart, there's no telling what they'll do. Now, it wasn't the Philistines' card, it was one made like that. All right, David got mad. I don't understand this. Went home, left it in the house, and later checked on it and found out the blessings of God was on that home. And, and he said, let's go get it. But this time, let's find out how. And you know the story. I'm cutting it short. It was to be born on the bare shoulders of the priest. I've got a message I preach and call it the evolution of Pentecost, and if you'll have to allow that, I'm trying to produce a thought. I do believe God used the reformers. I didn't say they were saved. I don't know where they're at. I'm just saying I believe he used them. 
as far as they let him. I really do. I believe just as much as the Philistines could keep the ark, and yet it didn't fit, it brought judgment, it brought problems. I believe that different men in our bygone days have used truths. But when that ark was taken, they set it beside Dagon, Dagon fell over and broke, left the stump, and that's what we're fighting today is. The Trinitarian idea is the stump of that old dagon that fell back yonder. I wish they had knocked it out of the roots and wouldn't have had no problem with Trinitarians today. But the stump was there. They said, get it out of here. Well, they went over here and the sores broke out. And they said, get it out of here. Went over here and they said, we can't stand it. And that one can't stand it. Finally, Joshua, the best of my, said, we're the rightful owners. We're kinsmen. And and we can take it. And he took it and opened it up and let everybody look at it and 40,000 men died. And he said, to whom will it go up from us? And who can stand before this holy God? David said, we're the rightful owners. We'll get it. And before it was over with, he decided he, it was too hot for him. What I'm saying is the constant evolution, the process, of the dark ages, the time of the falling away, when truth went into complete oblivion. Now then the steps back, Martin Luther, the whole bunch brought a step by step. I didn't say they're saved. Don't go tell him other beings that they're saved. But each step, but each one of them got to a point and said, we can't go any further. That's good. And you know that it came to our friends, the Assemblies of God, and they offered us this, the Methodists offered shouting and talking in tongues and falling out and praying for the sick, and, and a little was added to that, and it was called the Assemblies of God, and then first thing you know, one this group came into being, and, and there was still a lot of trinity in that. One of the former leaders of that first group that evolved out of Trinitarianism told me one time, he said, Brother Bing, you do believe the Trinities are going to be saved, aren't you? I said, no, sir, unless they're baptized in Jesus' name. He said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Get out of those fellows. In fact, the same man told me, he said, I don't even believe I'll go in the rapture. I'm going to stay here and help the Trinitarians make it in during the tribulation." Wow. But I'm showing you in the evolution, you see weaknesses. Finally, it strengthened, strengthened, and strengthened until it was more than a little blessing. It became a necessity. And baptism in Jesus' name and all. But here we, listen, the reason I contend we've got to have a revival is I have never seen the restoration of the church. Yes. Read your books of past Pentecost and I don't find it anymore. They had their gifts, they had all of that, but while they had it, they were still believing the Trinitarians were saved. There still was the church government. Some of the old reformers would go from town to town and pray 200 through and leave them without a pastor. You tell me that's perfection? I say we still got to have a revival. But you know what God had to do? He had to bring violence to the church. Maybe, maybe I rushed too fast through that and you didn't get the point. I, that's a two-hour sermon and I tried to give it to you in three minutes. I say that we evolved, 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 and each time something was strengthened until the point we received the revelation of oneness again from the original church. We received baptism in Jesus' name. We received the talking in tongues of necessity. We received the gifts of the Spirit. We received holiness. We received all of that. And now, the lacking part was church government. You can say what you want to, they didn't have it. I give honor to every old time preacher. One of the oldest men in Louisiana stood up one time and made this statement. He had established, I think, oh, I don't know. There's no telling how many churches I say established. He went and prayed hundreds through in Louisiana. But he stood up and said, I made a terrible mistake. I never stayed with one of them. And they faded away. I wonder if we'd understood church government back yonder and placed pastors there and had all of the thing in order, how many, how much further advanced we'd be today. I'm not reflecting. I'm thankful for their sacrifice. I'm thankful for what they offered us. But let's face it, there was still something to be had. Yes, sir. And we're being made conscious of that more now than ever. We didn't need a new dimension. We didn't need a uh, uh, office. That wasn't what we needed. 
We needed the ministry to put back where they belong. If a man prays 200 through, don't leave him without a pastor. I believe we are at the point that we could have that total revival. I really believe. I think we are church government enough, conscious enough. I believe we're holiness conscious enough. I believe we know the necessity of the Holy Ghost enough. If we could get now the balance yes. of evangelism and church government and holiness, we are at the point that we could go the farthest that any group has ever gone. Yes, but if you're going to sidetrack on the tangent of all church government, yes. all holiness, no mercy, no evangelism, we're just the maintenance crew out tapping along on the streets, keeping the whole fluffed up, and another says, oh no, all we need to be doing is take a bulldozer and go right down through there and open up new roads. No, we got to have those. We need that maintenance crew keeping that road up, and we need that bulldozer making a new one. Brother Dean, are you trying to talk out of both sides of your mouth? No, sir. I'm saying with the best what we've ever been to have a revival. If you're willing to say, my little ideas, I've got to throw them down. I've got one little subject I like, and that's evangelism. You better like holiness with it. You better like baptism in Jesus' name with it. You better like the whole works. Let's bring everything up to date. Not even say bring it up to date. Like it. preaching holiness. I like that as much as I do baptism in Jesus' name. I can get as anointed to listen to that as I can any subject. When a man is preaching church government, that chill's going to nail my spine. When they're preaching one man, I can hear that too. Oh, Lord, it's never come too old to me. I like one this, don't you? I preached on this Sunday morning. Teach all grow up around here and get off of one this. Do it, and you'll wind up with a bunch of young ones that don't know the difference. It's a mistake you're making, sir. I've heard all I want to hear of that. Maybe so, but you've got somebody following you that hadn't heard it enough yet. It's hard for me to believe. Look, can't I help you something? I want to revive as bad as I can on the But I don't want one of these blossom mushroom things that'll die. How's a squalling and begging and this knocking around and pleading with God in a revival one time. And we'd gone a bunch of weeks and I couldn't pray. I don't think we'd pray but about 20 or 30 through and I was about to die and I was complaining to God and he stopped me one day. And if I ever had a whipping, rebuking, stern talking to, he said if I gave you what you wanted, you would destroy this church. If you had 100 new souls with all of their weaknesses dropped in the lamp of this church that's got adulterers, that's got clamorers, that's got rebellious hearts, that's got... Now take all of that weakness and put it in the same pot. Yes, sir. You may not think God talks in these terms, but he did to me. He said it's pouring water in the soup. He said, let me build the foundation and then you can go as high as you want to on it. If you'll build a foundation, that building can't be hardly built too tall. But these little jerks that want to get up and quickly have a revival and a mass outpouring and a mass outreach, but don't want to bring anything up to date, 
Turn your head, Abraham. Oh, no. In the church that's looking at some bunch over yonder, have a big thrust, and you don't know how many of them got the Holy Ghost. And Catholic Bishop was saying, Holy Mary, Mother of God, too fast. He didn't get the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Oh, yes, I heard. Oh, I'm not excited over charismatics. They don't bother me even now. It's another thing pressuring us. It's another thing that, wait, well, let's go back again. Just before we had a move of God, let a ring sprung out and scared everybody. All right. God's trying again. The cycle, as they talk about today, is trying to come around again. And what's happened? The devil's jumped the gun and got a bunch of charismatics going to either lead the enthusiastic astray that don't have a message or to make those that need a good revival in them scared. I'm not scared either way. I'm not afraid of going overboard and don't let anybody go up. Somebody gets up. You see, here's our problem, say. Here's our problem. These fellows called preachers are something. They are something. They're not going to preach unless they. Well, it's like a friend of mine. We're preaching for a man, and he said to him, that the pastor said to him, where he's preaching. He said, you beat anything I've ever seen. He said, when you get ready to nail it down, you tack it down all the way around. <laughs> then you tack it all through the middle. Tack it down. And then you get up on it, and you tack it down all the way around. And you jump up and down, and then you just lay down on it. <laughs> he was saying, in other words, you're pretty thorough. Now, if we're going to preach today on insect, if you're not careful, we will actually sound contradictory to you because we're going to sell you on that one second. You understand what I'm saying? All right, we're talking about no sin, no sin, no sin. God will judge you. God's judgment. Fear of God. And if you're not careful, you'll actually forget there was a cross. Because we're making it look so serious than it is for you to see. Turn right around, and if we're not careful, preaching on the love of God and forgiveness, it'll make it look like you could do anything you wanted to do and get by with it. You better learn to balance it in your own house. Don't forget the cross and his mercy. But don't forget, he also said, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound so of the dead? See, we take it down to thirty. We're going to thoroughly come in, man. We're going to give you the subject. And it's going to be a lawyer's presentation. All right. If, if I want to preach on worship today, if I'm not careful, you know what I'll do? I'll make it look like a sin almost to sit and let go by. Why, them old carnal people that sit around and listen to Bible lessons ought to be up jumping up to people. Yeah. Aren't y'all spiritual around here? Bless God, I believe in the Holy Ghost. Come on, obey the Spirit. And the time I finish with that, it looks like words don't mean nothing. But if I'm going to teach that you need to hear the word, it almost sounds like, shut up, hush. Uh -huh. But we're not going to, if my right arm needed exercising, I, I wouldn't cut the left one off to exercise it, would I? I'm going to be sure that right one gets it so whack. See, we could get a little bit. Let's leave a door open for something else. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, if somebody would teach worship, and then somebody come along and teach word, and somebody come along that couldn't pray nobody through and if they had to hardly, but they could teach you a Bible lesson, it'd be so dry, you'd almost go to sleep, but boy, the words would be good. We've got very little place for a teaching ministry. First place, pastors don't want them because they didn't pray a dozen times, they was through. Wait a minute now. Come on. We better make place for that or we won't have a complete revival to close this thing out. Bring that old dry man in and let him write up his little chalk, what do you call him? 
blackboard. His blackboard and all of them little old pictures he draws up there, let him draw. Yes, sir. Next time you get that young evangelist that eats the microphone, choose it. <laughs> And quit picking your lives and take all that God's done in His church. Yes, sir. And we'll have a revival, but we're spending time climbing back to where we were because we didn't bring everything up to date. We had a little revival and lost it because there wasn't enough to establish it. All right, we try to establish it and lose all the spirit and enthusiasm for an outreach. Listen, I believe I can be taught how to live consistently just your own day-to-day living and then the next night hear how to go reach the lost. Can I really have, have I got a heart big enough to take all of that in and apply? When I first took the church in Houston, we prayed them through nearly every service. And I watched it and we started losing them. And the Lord spoke to me and said, you're not teaching them, you're just using every service for evangelism. I stopped to teach and the revival died. A lot of it is the fact we're not prepared for that battle. One of them kind of snap their finger and they're always promoting, they're always doing. But you better watch the holiness than girls. He hadn't even stopped to think about how short the dress is. Well, had a fine friend of mine. He's as dear a friend as I've got in this world. Angela, she said, Brother Bean, I don't even think of what saints are dressed up. I don't even think of they've got a television. I'm after that center man back there. I said, but sir, you and your wife can go to a leper colony and have babies as often as nature allows women to have babies. But don't forget they're being born in a leper colony. And every one of them could die with leprosy and it has been better you than never have. I say it's better to not bring some in. Yes, sir. Leave them in the beer joint. Did you hear what I said? Yes, sir. Then to bring them into a church that has teach them to fight. Yes, sir. One, young, one couple came to the church and all of their life, there was an elderly couple, done retired. And they came into the church in one of our churches and in every organization they belonged to, in the clubs and the lodges, they have never had a falling out with anybody. They got the Holy Ghost and in six months was done on one side. And they themselves made this statement, I had to come to the church to learn to fight. No, I, I'm reluctant to go praying through when I know the pastor will not teach the message when I leave. The church will not live holy. There's adulterers in the church. First thing you know, one of them adulterers is will grab it. We're rebels in the church. We better clean that church out for a place for that baby. All right, sir. And if we bring everything up to date, we'll clean the church out. Yes, sir. Beware when all the gifts are saying, bless thee. Yes, sir. If every gift is saying, I love thee, darling. Thou art mine, and you're sweet, and God love you in the room. I'm scared to death of that. Didn't say God would comfort you with a gift. But don't misinterpret the word edification. Well, the best edification I ever got in my life, like to kill. I want to repeat, beware when all of your gifts brag on you. You better have one come down through here one of these nights and say there's sin in this church. There's wrong over here. Repentance needs to be made. What do you think he said when he said? Okay, here comes a sinner in the church. And the gift is operating. And before it is finished, 
It's not in their sin or own in this place. Say, God is in this place because it's revealed the secrets of his heart. I'm not, I am not excited over your big revival, your big thrust, your big idea. If all of your gifts are saying nothing but thou short dressed girls, I love thee. Thy long haired boys, thou art mine. You little sissy. I love all of you darling sissies. All of you little effeminate men, thou art my sweetie. No, sir. All right. Come on. Yeah. On the other hand, what if Richard would take the stuff today on mercy? And your appetite is built up. I've been there. I've been there when God wanted to talk love to his church. But they have their minds framed that they wouldn't respond to nothing but hard work. You're undeveloped, you're deformed. Yes, sir. If you'll pardon me for personal references, I, I can only speak of those things I know about. I was preaching in a place one time, and, and really, the, they had heard it all but when it came to church government and holdings. And, and, and you get the feeling sometimes that the reason they called you is to see if you could say it any harder than they could. Yeah. I don't like it. I don't like when you make a game out of it. I don't like it to be placed in the category of honey and fishing. good friend of mine, still is a good friend, but I don't have to agree with him. Called me one time, said, I'm coming to your town and set up a three-day tannery. That was his joking way to say, I'm going to do nothing but tan hides. Is it that cheap? Friend, if I can't preach it with compassion, rather than hunting hides and see who can attack the most on the wall, I know. There's a law in your Bible about a gory ox also. He's to be killed. Don't reduce it to that. Preach it straight and hard, but love them while you're doing it. Saints, shout over holiness. There's some that really likes it if you're going to challenge a camera. Just like holy. Paul said, I'm back at the prevailing bench, and it's because of one thing, you did not allow yourself to be developed. I travail in birth again till Christ be born. So if you come to the full stature of a man in Christ Jesus, listen, God never made one thing, not one thing, that he did not make the law of maturity in there. There's not a tree out here that God let grow that he didn't plan to mature when it became an acre. In the process of putting the right thing in that seed, he said, you'll be a great oak one day. Everything is planned for maturity, and so is the church. And I say we're at the stage. They were they were trying to figure out back yonder, uh, evolving out of Luther into others. It was a matter of, of what's get us out of this Catholicism. And they got a little touch of grace and a little touch of mercy and then a little more truth and a little more truth and a little more truth. And now we've got it all in front of us and we know what it's going to take. Don't let the devil sidetrack us with new hearts. man told me, and I'm not saying this malicious, but a man told me one day, I've got to say it to the be consistent with my message. He said, as an officer of this certain church group, I have done a lot for God. I said, if you did anything, you did it with one of the fivefold ministries. Don't start adding little offices to the thing and say, this is God. There are helps, but not in the, not in the category of a ministry. 
God never planned anything to supersede the fivefold ministry. Now, I wish I had some more time. You know what I preach on right now? It helps. Most unheard of message among us and the church will never grow until we know what it means. The old saint gets an anointing sometimes to testify and they become a preacher that cannot be controlled. Even a preacher jumps up in the church and says, I've got to go, and he's the more qualified to go in the full-time ministry because he doesn't understand what helps me. And how in the world, and I'm going to have it if God tarries, how am I going to control 1,500 people if my church doesn't understand the ministry of helps? I may have to have a dozen young men to help me. But if Brother Bean's not praying for me, I won't get my healing. If Brother Bean didn't come to the hospital to see me, I'm not offended. They just sent a helper up here. You little selfish, undeveloped. Where is your vision? Why couldn't you let that young man help like the Bible calls for and pray the prayer of faith and you come on back to church and shout about it and give God the praise no matter who did it anyhow and let's, let's scatter this thing out a little further. Oh, yes, sir. You know the reason why we never have got more than 250, why there was a time in Pentecost that was the largest church and you couldn't get none no bigger than that. This is the reason. We have no place for help. There's no place for anything but that one, one, one man. He's got to do all of the praying, all of the comforting, all of the handshaking, all of the car buying for you, the everything, or you are hurt and offended. You better grow up because this thing's fixing to run off and leave you. All right. I haven't got out of church government. Listen, there's a pastor over all of this, but there's helps in your Bible. It's there. Don't hide your face from me, dear Lord. Hold my hand. Oh, Lord. Oh, 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 Please. Please. I just could scream tonight. I could scream. Oh, Oh, I'm going to do everything I possibly can, right? I'm going to do everything I know. I've been standing, looking down a narrow I've been wandering so far from God and sin, but the same road will lead me home again. That same road will lead me. No matter what my since I've been so far from God. Somebody's looking down the road, right? The further you go down it, the more danger you get into. I've 
No matter how far you be every since you've been so far from God, I've been standing looking down a narrow road, trying to find my way back home. I've been wandering. So far from God and sin, but the whole thing will lead me home again. could you help me? I no matter how far I've been Oh, 
Thank <laughs> you. 